America's national defense, America's armed forces is should be, and it's amazing that I even have to say this out loud, it's supposed to be to defend America. It's to keep us safe from attack anywhere and to give us the capability to strike back and defeat any uh, opponent that ever dares to attack us. That's what it's supposed to be for. What it's not supposed to be for is to potentially provoke an opponent to actually strike us. And there's always a fine line you have to, to, to follow between having a strong deterrent and then going too far to having a, a provocation. And I think that something we're going to show you today, you may not have seen, uh, and we're going to have a, a prof MIT professor Ted Postal on. It's going to come explain some things to you that I'm sure promise you, you're not going to see anywhere else. In fact, all you're going to see is an explanation of what happened. But Professor Postal here is going to be telling us what is likely to happen. Uh, first of all, before we even get into that, uh, Professor, welcome back to the show. Always a treasure, a pleasure to have you on. Well, it's a great pleasure to be on your show. You guys do a very good job. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And one of the reasons we do is because we have people like you that come on. We have the experts that are necessary to really show the people what's at stake and what's important here and why sometimes the public comments by some of our senior officials is not something that you should just uh, reflexively trust. I know hard to imagine that's the case, but this is just another chink in that armor and why people do start to question the government when they say stuff like what we're about to show you. First of all, just to set the stage so you're aware of what we're even talking about here, the United States has recently announced uh, that we're going to be sending a new uh, section uh, or a new category of missiles into Germany. Specifically, we're going to send some Tomahawks, some hypersonics, and some other long-range fires into Germany. So by definition, that means that we're introducing something into Germany that hasn't been there before and potentially elsewhere in Europe. And of course, this has drawn a response from Russia with this. They're saying uh, that there's going to be a, a price to pay for this. And, and the first question that would really need to be asked is, is there a new threat from the Russian side that didn't exist before that necessitated the, the introduction of new American missiles? And so just first of all, uh, Professor, on the top on the top here, uh, I wonder if you can explain to us what these missiles are that have uh, that are being deployed and what they're supposed to counter. Well, it's it's not clear that there's been any thinking on uh, and part of anybody uh, in either the U.S. or NATO on this thing. Uh, in fact, I am sure that nobody in the American military or uh, or intelligence community has properly analyzed the implications of what is be now being proposed. Let me uh, let me ask, uh, suggest that if there's a journalist in the audience who actually wants to ask a serious question of these people, uh, the journalist should ask, do you think it's in the interest of the United States and, and stability to pose a threat that uh, a threat that would give the Russians no more than two or three minutes of warning, uh, in you know, of of the destruction of Moscow by a nuclear attack, two to three minutes. Or if you want to reflect on that, what would you think as an American if the Russians devised some weapon system that could uh, could destroy Washington? within two to three minutes of us getting warning. Do you think this would be a, 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 a stabilizing uh, kind of... Yeah, uh, but the, Cuba somehow, somehow comes to mind to answer your second question. Not sure we would. <laughs> no, no. I think uh, the, 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 the real, the primal problem with the Cuban Missile Crisis was not just the Monroe Doctrine, which of course is a, a big political... Uh, you know, uh, policy that the United States has that no foreign state should be allowed to uh, have a, a military, significant military presence in, in, in our hemisphere. <laughs> a lot of Latin, Latin Americans would have a problem with me saying it this way, but I just want to be clear about the American perspective on this. Yeah. But, um, uh, but the real problem with the Cuban Missile Crisis is far more important is the extremely short timelines the United States would have warning of a nuclear attack if it were were to, were to have been launched from from the island of Cuba, and um, 
uh, we uh, almost had a nuclear war over right. the effort to um, uh, to uh, reverse that unwise decision on the part of the Russians. And uh, what we are now setting up uh, is a situation that I would call uh, uh, an unstoppable on steroids version of the Cuban Missile Crisis that could not be reversed in a time of tension. Because during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there weren't large numbers of nuclear weapons of very short range and very short delivery time pointed at each other. And it would, you know, it was possible for the Russians to think it through and agree uh, to withdraw these uh, these weapons from Cuba. And of course, we actually agreed uh, without much uh, public discussion to withdraw our Atlas uh, missiles from In Turkey, uh, Turkey yeah. which was which was also a benefit to Russia because the short warning times there. Now, now I know, Professor, you're about to show us some of the graphic reasons why this is and why you're so alarmed. Uh, I want to kind of set the stage politically, first of all, to what some of the actors are saying. First of all, here's a senior American official telling us how, you know what, for the this is really swell. This is really a good idea. Capabilities, And I'm very happy to um, answer any questions you have on the capability itself. But I would just like to very quickly go back 75 years, which is um, when President Truman said that the North Atlantic Treaty would be a shield against aggression and shield against fear of aggression. This is just yet another step. Here we are 75 years later where we can put a capability that will continue to be a deterrent and a shield um, for, the, for uh, NATO and the greater Euro-Atlantic security. Okay. Yes. That's, that's all well and good. I mean, that is categorically why the NATO exists for defense. We've kind of screwed that up here in, in uh, the last few years, but uh, we'll, we'll discuss that another time, but that's what the uh, objective is. They claim that the U S government is claiming that it to help us now. Here's yeah, but this, the, this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. This is an example of how these people who claim to be knowledgeable know nothing because Somebody should ask Mr. Israel, is, does he think it's a good idea to threaten uh, Moscow with nuclear attack where they would have only two to three minutes of warning in a crisis where they would know that they could be destroyed within two to three minutes of knowing that something bad is about to happen? Does he support that as a policy? Does he think that this is a stabilizing deterrent situation? Or does he think it's it's a provocation, a vicious provocation that nearly guarantees a, a spark point that could lead to World War III at some future time after these deployments begin in 2026. Well, I mean, self-evidently, he, he I, I don't even know if he's given this thought. It, it's entirely possible he doesn't even realize that, even though he may know oh, which I, I doubt he realizes it, it but he ought, to, he ought to not talk <laughs> if he doesn't realize. He ought to do his homework. I'm sorry, I'm on this. Fair enough. This role these days of uh, of going after political leaders, because I've seen too much and I'm fed up. Well, and, and, and now, in that. case you need your blood pressure a little higher, uh, <laughs> here is the leader of the uh, Chancellor of Germany, who also yeah. thinks it's a swell idea. But the United States decided to deploy the precision strike capabilities in Germany, which I think is a very good decision, and it fits into all the decisions we already took. So, I mean, it's, there's not well, much difference in daylight between what him and Mr. Israel said. Does Does Mr. Schultz think that it's good that uh, the GDP growth of Germany last year was minus 0.3 percent because of a decision that he participated in? He, he was he was in the White House participating in this decision to destroy the Nord Stream pipeline, which is what Biden did early in, in, in I guess it was 2022. Yeah, I mean yeah. the the economic consequences for Germany and France and Europe in general have been catastrophic, and yet he continues this man mindlessly. I'm sure he has German officers. I met a I met a, a bunch of high level German officers who actually think about because Germans' military tradition leads to people who really do think, and uh, he couldn't have asked any of his own people about this. It's it's. You know, he's really not qualified to be uh, 
the prime minister of, of Germany. So I, I, obviously, that they're just going down the path of of this the standard spin. This is what America said, so they're just going to spin it and say, "Yeah, we think it's a great idea." But but I, I mean, let's get back to the to the point of it. What is in, to your knowledge, what in the Russian arsenal is new that necessitates the deployment of these missiles? Nothing. But but what I'm what I'm concerned about is that the Russians are going to uh, just, they say they're going to respond. And I don't know what they're going to do. But uh, it's a reasonable guess, which I hope won't occur. But it's hard for them. You know, they have a political system, too. And uh, people are going to be screaming to respond. And if they respond, they will deploy a lot of other, a lot of their own short-range uh, nuclear-armed uh, systems. They, when, when, when the United States very unwisely uh, chose to withdraw in 2019 from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, the Russians actually made an independent statement saying that they are going to observe the terms of the treaty, uh, even though the treaty was no longer being enforced. And uh, they've stuck by that. And I think that was a very good choice on the part of the Russians. But the United States, which would blame Donald Trump for being the uh, uh, the um, policy idiot who withdrew from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, what we are now doing is implementing uh, um, the, the worst possible uh, possibility that the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty would have would have uh, stopped. And, and and let's actually take a look. This this is this is what uh, Sergey Ryabkov, I believe this is his first name, Ryabkov, there, the deputy foreign minister, uh, actually addressed the Russian response. Watch this. This is aimed at us, of course. We must be aware of this. But there is no reason for nervousness or any alarm because we began to prepare for such a development a long time ago. The aggressive course of the United States and the North Atlantic Alliance, led by Washington, is not changing. But we cannot be intimidated. We will find a response. And so you're concerned that when he says we will find a response, that it's going to be in the form of additional short-range nuclear missiles. Right. I think uh, that's a possibility. I hope it's not going to happen. But I think that's the uh, simplest possibility. If the Russians have something uh, up their sleeve that uh, will create a problem for the West, but not this kind of problem, escalating the chances of an accident, uh, so be it. That would be good. But I think the very likely response would be the deployment of uh, INF non-compliant weapon systems, which now, the Russians uh, have refrained from. Now, we're, 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 I want to get into, because I, I know you have some, uh, some uh, slides here that you can show that graphically depict some of the reasons why you're concerned. Uh, heading into that, I, I want to show you, and, and this is what I, I think that your presentation is actually going to counter. This is uh, Mr. Israel again, actually saying, you know what, this is really a good idea. I don't know why you're not behind it. Russia is, as it could be expected, fuming, uh, saying that this is a link in the chain of a course of escalation. What's your response to that? Well, what I would say is, is that we place security architecture with our allies in Europe, regardless of the capability or the number or the uh, personnel or the training based on what we view as a threat, both now and into the future. Um, so we do that primarily as NATO is founded to be a deterrent, to be a shield, and we'll continue to do that. Anything else, any comment about something being responsive is simply uh, avoiding the fact that we are putting things in place that will keep the citizens of our uh, and our allies safe. Now, aside from the fact that this guy really comes across like a PR front man, not any kind of an actual official, what do you say to refute what he claims first, that this? Would first keep of all, let me say I, I have no idea what he said, and my and my view is that neither did he. <laughs> it was just it was just monkey talk. I mean, it was silly. It had nothing to do with the issue. Uh, the issue is whether or not this is going to provoke uh, a, a situation where the chances of an accidental nuclear war are going to be substantially increased very substantially increased in a potentially unstoppable way. And I doubt he knows anything or thought anything or has been briefed on any of this. 
because I doubt anybody has thought about it. You know. So yes, yeah, so, so you you have a presentation there. I wonder if you can kind of get into that to show us why you think he's wrong and what the danger really is. Okay, um, I um, my uh, I have a a very I think this happened once. I have a very sophisticated computer <laughs> <laughs> that has ar artificial intelligence always framing my, and and now it's decided to stop working. So. <laughs> But I can't. Yeah, yeah, I see it zoomed in and nowhere on your on your bookshelf there. But uh, um, right. see if we can get that right. fixed. But in the meantime, yeah, let's go ahead and jump yeah. into your pr uh, proposal there. Uh, and and Gary will roll to the page you want him. Okay. All right. Why don't we uh, look at uh, the next slide, slide number two? And what this shows is the situation that existed when the Russians. Uh, put uh, uh, three different kinds of long-range uh, nuclear-armed ballistic missiles into Cuba. And the uh, circular curves just show the rough radius of these ballistic missiles. Uh, and I uh, uh, put in these, uh, uh, I added the time in minutes it would take from launch to impact uh, for uh, these ballistic missiles to reach various American cities. If we go to the next slide, we'll just, slide three, uh, we'll just see the same thing. It's not shown on the map, but you'll note that um, uh, the timeline, I, what I just put here for your audience is the distances and kilometers and the time to impact. But if we go to the next slide four, number four, we'll see that if you look at the warning timelines from German territory to Moscow, it's six to eight minutes, assuming, assuming we are talking about ballistic trajectories, that is to say, missiles that are flying under the influence of only gravity uh, and, and momentum. But a um, uh, a um, hypersonic vehicle uses lift from the atmosphere. I'll show some diagrams later, but which could compress the time to maybe uh, under three minutes and, and, and possibly uh, two or three minutes uh, with regard because the horizon, the radar can see over because the Earth is curved, is uh, makes it impossible to see the missile coming uh, because radars. Um, uh, look in a straight line. Uh, if you look at the next slide, number five, we see the situation. Uh, um, the lower curve, um, which shows one minute, the points at one minute intervals, well, points at 10 second intervals, and then the, the more heavy circles show the one minute intervals. We can see uh, launched at roughly 500 kilometers uh, from the left axis to around 2,000 kilometers, which would be the 1,500 kilometers from the eastern border of, of, uh, of, of, of Germany to Moscow. And uh, if you see, um, if you look at the uh, actual uh, curve where the uh, Russian radar might actually start being able to see this uh, depressed trajectory, ballistic trajectory, it's about, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven minutes, but you know, where they would see, they would have time to see this thing coming in, which is not a very long time and it's also not, not a constructive situation. But if you can imagine that this curve was instead a line that uh, was uh, running parallel to the surface of the earth, and um, and maybe at an altitude of 50 kilometers, you could see that the um, trajectory of this object would only allow the radar to begin to see it uh, maybe two or three minutes uh, before it arrived because the speed would be very close to the same, but the line of motion would be very close to flat. So uh, because it would be getting lift from the atmosphere. And um, so you would be down to, um, to uh, two or three minutes of warning time. But that assumes a missile 
that has a has a maybe a a burnout speed of a little bit over four kilometers per second. But the ballistic missile that they're talking about that uh, has almost certainly would have a burnout speed of close to six to seven kilometers per second. I'll show you. <clears throat> I'll show you what that missile looks like. Yeah, and and actually, Ted, I wonder if I could ask, um, yeah. just so we can get your camera back on track here. Maybe if you could just like leave the 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 topic or or, or leave the uh, uh, our show, come back in and see if your camera resets because yeah. we are you we still seeing miss the arm on? No, it's completely off. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, give that a I'm shot. Gonna see if it's going to work. And in, in okay. the meantime, uh, you know, I'll just talk about really. This gets into uh, fundamentally. The, the the problem that I talked about at the outset of this, when is it in your interest to go in a direction that deters an enemy? So if they are thinking about attacking you, if they see this capability, they'll think twice about it or not do it at all. And then at what point do you have so much capability that it actually prompts the other side to start taking on capabilities to, to make it more likely to actually respond and retaliate. And, and, I, and I think that's where we're at here. The reason why I kept asking that same question over and over, which you know hasn't been answered by anyone in the U.S. government so far, what changed? So this is a new deployment. What changed now that's going to cause the, uh, the United States to say, oh gosh, we need to actually put this new capability there. Otherwise, our security is going to be at more risk because Russia is doing A, B, and C, whatever that is. So far, I've not heard any A, B, and C that Russia is doing differently. So then when has to ask the question of the United States, that means Joe Biden, ultimately, because he's the president, what prompted you to do this now and what benefit does America derive? And so far, Professor, I don't see any benefit, but I see a lot of risk. Yes, you're right. And, uh, and I, I, you know, so far I've focused on, you know, sort of the, what I would call the uh, nitty gritty technical details, but there's a, a social, political, um, bureaucratic dimension to this. And that is uh, how well the uh, political decision makers are informed. And I'm afraid uh, we're talking about uh, political decision makers being very ill-informed and we have we have a history of this. So if you look at the slide number seven, uh, which I uh, put together, this is a title page uh, from a, a highly classified document that was only recently declassified. Why it was classified from the American people is another long discussion about the misuse and abuses of classification. But this is a document. Uh, called the Soviet War Scare. This was the, uh, a group, the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, got together years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and reviewed what the uh, political leadership of the United States was being told uh, about the missile crisis. I'm sorry, not the, I'm sorry, not the missile crisis. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> The uh, 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 an event called Abel Archer, which occurred in 1983. Abel Archer was a uh, a NATO exercise where uh, there was an exercise. Uh, you know, it's a uh, planned and practiced where there was a general uh, development toward a war in NATO, and everybody in the system was practicing, receiving information making decisions and moving forward. And um, you want to exercise the decision-making apparatus. That's just part of, uh, of the process of planning to be able to react to a crisis. An interesting thing about this exercise, I thought, uh, which is described in this document, is that when things got hard, bad enough that the, um, uh, in the in, this is an exercise, of course, um, the decision was made to an attack to attack uh, an Eastern European city. So, at the time all this was being debated, the argument was that we're only going to attack military targets. <laughs> but in this particular exercise, there was a decision made by the group of people involved to attack a city, and then, according to the exercise, which of course there are people on the other side 
were making decisions, which, you know, it's questionable how much they understand. The people on the other side calling the game rules uh, chose to, to not respond. The, the Russians did not, in this exercise, respond, flow up because of the attack on the city. So the response was to attack another Eastern European city. So, and then this escalated to a general nuclear war in this exercise. So um, the important thing about this exercise was that the Russians were monitoring it. And they, they believe, or at least some of it's a complicated situation, but uh, it's clear that some parts of the Russian government at the leadership level were concerned that the Able Archer exercise was a uh, uh, was actually a precursor to a sneak attack that the Europeans and the United States was going to make against Russia. So the, the highest levels of the Russian government, there were people who were concerned. So they put, for example, um, uh, planes in 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 uh, East Germany. They had them on the ground ready to fly in case there was a, uh, an attack. So they put them planes on alert. They uh, they uh, put a surveillance aircraft, uh, many more surveillance aircraft out over the uh, Baltic Ocean looking for U.S. Navy assets moving into the Baltic. Um, they, they did a whole host of communications exercises to be prepared to strike the United States, and they of course had a doctrine at that time that if they had concluded that the United States was going to attack first, that they would preempt a very dangerous doctrine. Now, in fairness to the Russian thinking, they understood that if they preempted, it would be the destruction of Russia. So they weren't cavalier about it as some people like to misrepresent the Russian views of this. They understood that preemption was not really a viable option. But the point is that they that, that they were revved up and preparing to fight a nuclear war because they thought the United States was preparing to start a nuclear war against them. Now, now, now Ted, I, I want to ask you this a specific question here because I, I'm going back a little bit to, to one of the previous times you were on our show and you were talking about the attack that has been made on the Russian advanced warning radar system. So that's one thing. Now then here comes this new uh, systems in place. And I understand uh, in your uh, presentation here, you've got a description of what the weapon systems themselves look like. And there's some association with the INF treaty and the limitations or whatever. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit about what that looks like from the perspective of Russia that may be of concern. Well, I mean, the, uh, uh, the, the problem is that it is, um, you know the situation between Russia and the West is 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 asymmetric. I mean, or Russia and the United States is certainly asymmetric. The United States is far away; we have oceans between us and, and Europe, so we don't face the uh, short-range uh, missile threat uh, that the Europeans face and the Russians face. And to the uh, credit of both the United States and Russia. Uh, we entered this treaty after a very, very difficult time uh, where we were uh, in 1986, 87, and 88 uh, deploying uh, uh, Pershing ballistic missiles to Europe because we were trying to force the Russians, who had also deployed uh, a very dangerous short-range attack system, the SS-20 in particular, a ballistic missile. We were trying to force them to withdraw that missile from their inventory. And um, uh, people don't remember necessarily, but there, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the city streets in Europe, and actually in the United States at that time, calling for a nuclear freeze because people were really afraid that this was a tinderbox, and they were right. If it hadn't been for the people in the street knowing something more than the people who are supposed experts, like Mr. Israel, um, if they didn't have the common sense to know what, what we were looking at, uh, this thing might have gone on and eventually a spark could have occurred, which would have caused World War III, and none of us would be here today to talk about it. 
And um, so the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, was a gigantic step forward in removing these weapons, which are short range, short warning time, yeah. quick launch kinds of systems. And it's it's bad enough that strategic systems are short or short warning or short short warning, but at least at tens of minutes, not minutes. And um, so uh, when we withdrew, the United States withdrew from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, this was a major, major blow to uh, the stability, nuclear stability in Europe. And it's very important to realize that nuclear stability in Europe is also global nuclear stability because I don't think there has been an exercise ever where uh, an exercise where we had a nuclear war start in Europe did not exercise did not uh, expand into a general nuclear war leading to World War III, and it's easy to see why because American systems and Russian systems are involved and NATO systems are involved and the long, there's no clear demarcation in doctrine between the longer range and shorter range systems. And it would escalate out of control uh, very quickly. So, so Europe should be seen as a potential tinderbox for starting World War III. And we should treat it as a special place because of that. And we don't. We're, there's nobody in the American political establishment who seems to understand anything about what we went through in the 1980s, almost having a nuclear accident that could have resulted in World War III. So and I, I, want, I want to shift gears a little bit to, to the current concerns here. And, and as part of your presentation here, uh, like you talk about some of these 40-foot vans designed to hold Aegis cruise missiles, and you talk about uh, elsewhere in the presentation about how it's nearly impossible for the Russian side to distinguish uh, what are in some of these launch canisters from one top to another? And I wonder if you explain why that's a problem. Well, let me, uh, uh, let's go to slide number 11. There you go. Now, this is an example of a deployment of uh, the current uh, system that we already have. Uh, these uh, vertical launches that you see uh, popped up on these vans, which look like 10 ton trucks. So, so if you were looking at Germany in, with spy satellites or aircraft or whatever, you know, you couldn't tell these things from a 10 ton truck that's delivering fruit. So, you know, so these things would be extremely hard to identify. And, uh, you know, which would complicate this, what the situation with regard to, you don't know how many of these things there are, where they are, what they're up to. So, so this would make the, you know, pre-warning uh, very, very, very difficult for the Russians. It would be hard for them to even tell if there was an escalation in the readiness to strike Russia uh, with these systems. Now, if you just want to get a sense of, where these systems come from. Let's just jump to slide number 18. And what those canisters that you see, there are four of those canisters in each of the trucks where they're vertically sitting. They're the same canisters that were designed for uh, the ship launched uh, Aegis uh, weapon system. So any one of those canisters could carry uh, a nuclear armed cruise missile with a range of 2,500 kilometers, or uh, a, uh, a ballistic missile with a range of perhaps 2,000. I actually designed, I spent the last week designing a ballistic missile mm. to see, you know, what was available with off-the-shelf American technology. You could put a ballistic missile in this container that has a 2,000 kilometer range easily reaching a Moscow. Um, or in this particular case, an SM-6, it's a surface-to-air missile because uh, give the, they want to give the system some air defense. But uh, if you look, uh, if you switch back to um, uh, slide 12, you see these are the four canisters sitting in the, in the uh, van. 
And you can see, if you look to the left, the optimized vertical launch system module, they've added, if you look at the lower left corner, uh, bottom corner of the uh, uh, of the devices, they have some exhaust pipes because on the ship, the uh, the exhaust is, run, is handled the, from the rocket being launched is handled by a different system, but it's basically the same system. So um, now uh, what the Americans have said is, well, the INF treaty is no longer being enforced. So we're, we can we can and we are going to deploy this. That's their argument. But let's go back to slide um, 10. Numeral 10. Now, this is the Aegis Ashore system. And this is the same system <coughs> that we said we couldn't deploy because of the INF treaty limitations, but we did deploy it before the INF treaty, 10 years before the INF treaty was, was canceled by the United States, not the Russians. We put this thing out in 2009, the uh, 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 Hillary Clinton was then Secretary of State and she, uh, she and her buddy, Mike McFall, who runs around Stanford talking about how the Russians are aggressive and things like that. They put out this, they announced in 2009 during the Russian reset, uh, it was this big reset, which was incidentally, it failed because of the Russians, according to Mike McFall, because of the Russians. Now think of you, think if you were Russian and in 2009, when we had the INF treaty, you were claiming there was a reset. We were trying to reset our relations so that we're less confrontational, less in confrontation. And the first thing I do is deploy a system that's not compliant with the INF treaty, that also can launch nuclear armed cruise missiles at short ranges against Russia. It might not fly well with the Russians. It seems to me that Mr. McFall as usual, has the arrow pointing in the wrong direction. So, so let me ask you something, Professor, and, and I, I may be requested that you speculate here because you may not have any direct knowledge here, but w as best you can understand, what is the motivation of the United States senior officials to take these actions here, which don't do anything to improve our security because we have plenty of uh, mil uh, nuclear weapons that can be launched from you know any of our nuclear triad from nearly anywhere in the world to defend us should we ever get it. But by doing these things which violated the, the terms of the agreement, which can only anger the other side and can only maybe make them want to take countermeasures, why would we do these things? Well, uh, first of all, NATO... I think the future of NATO is really questionable at this point. We don't know what's going to happen, but you know, if Trump tends to is reelected, you know, he may he he may just withdraw from NATO. Americans and and NATO is just a rubber stamp for American policy. You know, Olaf Scholz, um, uh, Emmanuel Macron, these guys are not. They don't think at all. They they, they just. Anything the Americans say they want to do, these guys just run, they fall over themselves to do. The, the, the political leadership of NATO is completely infantilized. And um, uh, they, have, they have lost the war in Ukraine. They, they, they had this sad and disturbing uh, NATO 75th anniversary where they're talking about winning the war. I mean, it, it, you look at it with the knowledge of what's going on in the war, you know that it is lost. I mean, you and I have chatted about yeah. this. And others have chatted about this. The war is over, except for what the Russians, how the Russians decide to finish off Ukraine. That's the question now. And, uh, and these guys are walking around and... Um, Talking about they've won. It's, just, it's like the most, it's bizarre. It's it's Donald Trump saying he really won the election. <laughs> you know, it's 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 just uh, you know, it's bizarre on all sides. I mean, the the uh the um 
delusional behavior of political leadership from all parts of the political animal that we see today is hard to believe. It's frightening. And so they've lost the war. And so now they want us to do something that says they're strong. <laughs> and they yeah, don't think nothing says you're strong, like causing yourself harm and damage. Uh, I, I wonder if you could also, about that. Yeah, for good reason. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could now kind of tell us a little bit about something we a lot of our viewers may not know about. I, I included in there as this uh, Typhon, I think it's called Typhon hypersonic missile. I know you have some information yeah. about that, too. What, what's the significance of that? Well, uh, it's it's a very large missile. Let me um, let's go to slide twenty one. It's just a word slide, and this is a silhouette of the missile, and it's con currently under development, as pointed out in the slide. But you know, this is not a complicated thing to build, given the technology we already have in hand. And of course, it's as I've already said, it's going to create a tremendous instability uh, with regard to uh, um, uh, uh, Russian early warning of, of nuclear attack against Moscow. If we just go to slide 22, I'll just give you a sense of what this missile looks like relative to the other missiles that would fit in the, uh, the uh, vertical launch system. I showed you these canisters earlier. So this thing would fit into a vertical launch system canister. The canister would be modified somewhat. Um, uh, let me show you, let's go to slide 25. Uh, this shows you uh, how it would sit in, but of course it would be, you couldn't tell the difference between this, uh, this vehicle and one that's containing four lighter, uh, less long range, slower missiles. And if you then look at um, um, uh, slide 24, this just shows you a, a concept of what this system could look like. In the lower right, there's a, a, a transporter erective launcher. It's called, it's called the modified M870. And it's set up to carry two of these missiles. And you can make estimates of the weight of this missile. I've, it's over 20,000 pound missile. It's a big missile. It's heavy. It's like a small ICBM. It's capable just using, just extrapolating from propulsion and, and missile technology we already have demonstrated. It could carry a 1,000 pound vehicle to a range of uh, 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers which basically means it could accelerate. If you look at this uh, hypersonic vehicle body uh, that's in the upper left on the yellow uh, background, uh, it could accelerate a body like this to a speed of close to uh, maybe six, six and a half kilometers per second. So that's uh, uh, Mach 20, Mach 18. And if we go to slide 23, you can see uh, in the lower hypersonic, if it were uh, launched as a ballistic missile, it could be seen as it rose over the horizon. You can see the radar detection horizon is shown uh, in this diagram. And it could be seen some minutes before it actually arrives. But if you look at the end point, it would actually not be seen very shortly before it arrived, maybe two or three minutes, maybe you know, two less than three minutes arriving at Moscow. So the radars at Moscow would only give it uh, two or three minutes. This is the missile we want to deploy to stabilize the situation, according to Mr. Israel, uh, in, in Europe. And we, we don't think about the threat, you know, according to him, we don't, you know, we're just doing it to enhance deterrence. See, and so this, this is what you. continues to, to just frustrate me uh, because if that was okay so it's a new missile it's a new capability fine as far as the technology goes but the capability is already there we can already launch hundreds and thousands of missiles at russia if we wanted they they wouldn't be able to shoot them down already 
right. and like you said earlier, I think in this that maybe maybe some of these businesses might give them as far as 10, 15 minutes notice, which is still nothing in comparison to an unexpected strike. So they're not going to be able to do it any. So why do I need to then add to the threat that the other side has to defend against when it doesn't benefit me any at all? That's what I, I just can't get past that. Well, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like uh, threatening to light a match in, in, in the proverbial room filled with gas fumes. It's just hard to believe. I mean, it's, why would you do that? You know, it, I mean, it makes no sense. And the reason it makes no sense is in part, I say in part, because a lot of these people don't think at all and, and have never done any thinking except how do they advance themselves within the bureaucracy. But, uh, but in part because these people are ill-informed and, they, and, and, and they're ill-informed in part because the government, the U.S. government, has collapsed in terms of having any kind of inside real analysis and intelligence support of uh, of people uh, in political making decisions, could we do we have time to go to a slide slide number eight? I just want to sure. If you stop me if I'm blabbering on. No, we got time for that. Okay, let's go to slide number eight. So this this president's foreign intelligence advisory board criticized the intelligence community the American intelligence community, for not understanding how dangerous the Able Archer system uh, uh, circumstance was and not alerting the political leadership to what had happened and what's going on. So not only did they not alert the political establishment when it was going on, because there were indicators we detected that the Russians were preparing to strike, and we didn't tell anybody in the in the political line of, uh, of command, uh, but we also never explained it or never analyzed it. And then this has happened in 1983. In 1990, this report comes out. So what the you know what's this? What's the intelligence community doing? How are they supporting uh, the the American political leadership? Now let me. I'm going to draw from my personal experience now which is more substantial than what I'm just showing you. But let's go back to that slide, if you don't mind, Gary. Uh, look at the first line. Failure of U.S. intelligence to report in 1996 there was a false alert of the Russian early warning system. I've talked a little bit about this on some shows. Um, it's, it's worth talking about literally for an audience some, in, in some detail. It... Uh, I know uh, Bill Perry for a long time at Stanford. He was never told about this. He learned about this after he was Secretary of Defense in a discussion from me. Wow. He was Secretary of Defense at the time of, of this event. Okay, let's, let's again go back to that slide. And there were shortfalls in the Russian space-based early warning system, which I discovered and members of my group discovered uh, sometime in 1997 and 1998. And we, and I was asked at that time by the Clinton administration to come into the Pentagon and review the American intelligence on Russia's early warning system. And so I was looking at the top line intelligence, your all source intelligence we had at that time. And I was asked to do this because Bill Clinton was thinking about doing something for uh, uh, to promote uh, the idea of uh, early warning cooperation with Russia. And that's where this crazy idea of year 2000 and when the computers were supposed to cause a World War III right. to happen and uh, a completely silly idea but meaningless anyway. But that's another. So I come in to the Pentagon and they throw all these books on top of me. Uh, I think it's the largest amount of special intelligence I've seen in my career, even though when I was in the Pentagon, I had a safe, safe filled with intelligence documents. And I'm looking at these documents and, and it's clear we had no idea 
that the Russians had no look down capability from space. They had no global surveillance from space. So I had to put together the information for the American intelligence community and the Department of Defense to let them know. And at that time, I was working closely with the Russians when I discovered it, not with, I didn't learn this from the Russians. I learned this from analyzing the false alert in 1996. And I felt that I owed the Russians um, my, uh, you know, my analysis because I didn't want the Russians to feel that I had used my contacts with them to, uh, 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 you know, to spy on them. And I also thought, that we needed to have cooperation with the Russians to help them uh, get their early warning system fixed. Because if they attack us because they think they're under attack, uh, that's, that's not, not good, good right? for anybody. Yeah, exactly. So I find myself in Moscow a few weeks later, you know, getting all my Russian friends in trouble with the FSB because these uh, idiots in the in the security community. I always have jokes with my Russian friends about who has bigger idiots in their security community. Um, they can't imagine that anyone could have figured this out. Must have been that somebody told me. But not true at all. I happened to be lucky, you know, to figure it out. So, uh, so our intelligence community did not know about this, and I presume our our our, um, uh, our president didn't know. And then after that, I go and meet with the president's science advisor. And um, uh, I'm blocking his name now, but uh, and uh, he, uh, he he's so smart. He just goes through all these charts like this. You know. I couldn't read the charts, even though I had put them together. And um, and then he dumps me off with his uh, military advisor, some uh, social climbing Air Force uh, colonel. And um, uh, and I go to his office because we're going to talk, you know, business. And and, and this guy s says to me, he sits there and he says, uh, "Can can you remind me uh, how uh, our uh, own early warning systems work in space?" And I said, to myself, "This guy doesn't know anything about our own systems," and he's advising the vice president's, um, you know. Uh, national security advisor. So what does a national security advisor know? So um, so then uh, if we go back to slide eight again, just to give you a little um, information, uh, the White House, uh, there was a, this terrible uh, attack, nerve agent attack in Damascus in August of 2013. The White House uh, published a, a, a big report on it, supposedly all source intelligence. Um, I, I forget, I, I, ben Rhodes was the guy who claimed to write the report. Um, you know, he's uh, yeah. And the yeah. interesting thing about Ben Rhodes writing this report is that it did not have a single technical fact about the situation correct. Wow. Nor did it have a single technical fact related to our early warning capabilities, correct? And our Secretary of State at the time, John Kerry, went before uh, the Senate um, uh, the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee and made statements that he was absolutely, we should get video of that sometime if I talk about this, because it's so great. Absolutely, with absolute confidence, made absolutely wrong statements about our early warning and monitoring capabilities. So either he was lying to the Foreign Affairs Committee or he didn't know, which no. is the equivalent of lying because as far as I'm concerned. And uh, meanwhile, Ben Rhodes, you know, in his self-aggrandizing uh, articles, uh, he explains that this guy Clapper was reviewing, Clapper was the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence in the White House. He, he reviewed all this because Ben Rhodes was right, you know, was asked to write this, so, you know, and you can see he writes so well. And I'm looking at this, there all these people, including President Obama, who was kept in the loop on this, had no idea what our intelligence capabilities were. They had no idea 
that all the evidence pointed to an attack that was that had to have come from had to have come from from uh, rebel controlled areas because the rockets that were used could not have flown the distance from uh, from Syrian government controlled areas to 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 to, to reach Zamalka where they landed. This was like a no brainer. You know, I, I talked to. I talked to my brother-in-law, who was an intelligence officer in Vietnam, and he said, well, of course. And I said, Rick, why, why didn't you say that to me? I had to keep figuring this out. I, I modeled the missiles. I calculated. He says, well, you, you never asked me. <laughs> so, so well, plus, on top of that, you, you have to factor in the issue that there was there would have been no reason for uh, Syria to use that at that point because they had, they were starting to succeed militarily and they had nothing to gain and everything to lose. Of course, from there it. were all these and, other factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet we were ready. We were ready to destroy the Syrian Syrian military forces at a time when, if we had succeeded in doing that, uh, Damascus would have almost certainly uh, fallen. Uh, uh, to the extremist uh, Muslims, you know, you know, it would have fallen, and um, so, uh, so, so now what I'm trying to give you is a, a picture from my narrow technology-based perspective. You know, I'm just a pointy-headed guy who thinks about missiles and war, but uh, you know, but you know, I have enough contact with these people to come to a conclusion that they are not properly informed. They don't care to be properly informed because you can fix this problem. What you have to do is have people at the CIA who know what they're doing because you can be sure that people at the CIA were able to do the analysis that I did. Yeah. Especially on Damascus, you know, so. And uh, my brother-in-law would have sat there if he were in the CIA, he was an intelligence officer. He would have said, what are you talking about? You know, he's not a tech. He's technical. He's quite right, but but he um, but he would he had the experience in Vietnam. You know, he saw the rockets of this kind of design, and he would have known instantly they couldn't they, they couldn't have long range. You know, just from experience, from his yeah. experience in the, in the intelligence community. So, so my concern, which you will hear time and again, and I will always be repeating this because. I think the American people need to understand this, that these characters who are in very high level decision making jobs do not have the kind of technical support they should be having. Uh, having a guy like Clapper, who clearly has no idea about the technical capabilities of U.S. intelligence, uh, technical intelligence systems, you can be sure there are people in the CIA who have detailed knowledge of this. But if the guy who sits on top informing the president, supposedly keeping the president informed, is too lazy or is uh, too anxious to be the one who talks to the president rather than letting someone else who really knows what they're talking about talk to the president, then you have the situation we now have. I don't think you have this situation in Russia because I've listened very carefully to Putin. And there's no question in my mind that Putin is on top of every detail yeah. of his his systems. And and frankly, that gives me great comfort because I think he's a very stable guy and he's much more stable than uh, Joe Biden. That's I mean, so embarrassing to have to say that out loud, but I mean the evidence as you say uh, certainly needs in that direction. Well, listen, we really appreciate you coming on today, Professor, and, and uh, really, you know, pointing out both the politics and the detail, the technical issues of why this this whole system is a bad idea. And if anything else, we we are at least aware of it. And hopefully we can get the word out to enough people that uh, they're aware of. This is not just some minor issue, that this is actually a significant issue, which could have significant negative ramifications for us if, uh, if things don't change. The beginning. This is the beginning of the construction of an unrecoverable crisis that will lead to World War III. Well, let's hope that's not the case. And, and especially well, let's hope that if, if anything, let's hope the current uh, uh, the election here might possibly provide a change to where we well, can we can change course. Happens, I think that would be helpful. Yes. 
but oh, uh, we'll I find out how it goes. But anyway, uh, thanks for coming on today very much because now we do have, we are armed with knowledge, even though it's very scary. And we thank you guys for coming on and joining us too. We always appreciate you watching us. We always value you, especially you guys who are really active in the, in the comment section there. I've been watching a lot of that going on there. Always appreciate that. Be sure and like, and subscribe though, folks, if you haven't already done so, please do and share this with your friends and we'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis deep dive.